title of our sermon this morning is called to be complete. Called to be complete. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Called to be complete. And we're called this morning to complete this letter together. Second, we're in chapter 13, in the final paragraph of this uh, wondrous, glorious, good, great uh, letter of Paul to the church at Corinth. So we now come to these closing statements. And as we consider this letter, we've been instructed by Paul through this letter. I'm sure you remember much of that instruction. We've been challenged by Paul. We've been convicted by Paul. There's much to be uh, convicted of here in these letters. Uh, Much growth we need, much wisdom we need, much help we need, much strength we need. Uh, We've been witness to Paul's heart in this letter, right? His love for the Lord's church, his love for the Lord's people. Uh, We've been exhorted and encouraged by Paul's example in ministry. Paul is a faithful apostle. He's a faithful teacher, a faithful preacher, uh, a faithful pastor, a faithful brother, right? Just faithful to the Lord. But as we consider Paul's example, Paul's instruction uh, here, Paul's witness, we're not to welcome this letter as the word of men. We are to welcome it as it is in truth, uh, as the very word of God. Amen? Amen as the very Word of God, intended by God to work in effectively, to work effectively in those of us who believe. It's the Lord's gracious instruction. It's His correction, His reproof, His example through the Apostle Paul as he imitates the Lord Jesus Christ, His witness to us. And beloved, let us not receive the grace of God in vain, right? We need to apply this well. We need to apply this carefully. We need to heed the words here spoken. We need to remember these things. Come back to them time and time again. But now, as Paul brings this stunning letter to a close, he does so in customary Pauline fashion with a closing exhortation, with affectionate greetings, with a warm heartfelt benediction or a blessing at the end. And so then, as Paul closes the letter, these are parting words, their final thoughts, They're summary statements of the Apostle Paul. And as parting words, summary statements, they're intended to have a lasting influence. They're intended to have lasting effect. These are things that we are to remember, we're to ponder, we're to meditate on them. And they tell us much about what is on Paul's heart and mind now as he writes this final paragraph to the church at Corinth. He's not concerned here, notice, with their physical health. It's important. He doesn't concern himself with that. He's not referring here to their physical comfort. It's not a priority of the Apostle Paul. He doesn't mention their physical wealth. He doesn't mention their physical prosperity. He's not concerned with their physical well-being. He's not concerned with his own reputation. And frankly, he's not concerned with their reputation either. Right? He's not concerned with their physical circumstances. He doesn't focus on their physical circumstances. Paul's concern here is not the temporal. It's not the physical. Paul's concern here, as he closes out the letter, is the eternal. Paul's concern is on those things that matter. Those things of lasting, eternal significance. That which is by far, by far most needful. It's most needful for you and I. We need to focus on those things. We need to keep our eyes focused on eternal and unseen things in the heavens right? We need to be focused on eternity. Our eyes, like your brand new driver, when you first start driving, if you remember this, I do, brand new driver puts his hands on the wheel and he's looking over the front of the hood of the car, like watching the lines go under the, you know. The experienced driver looks down the road, right? We get our eyes up. We look down the road. We want to be mature drivers. We want to get our eyes up looking down the road to our heavenly inheritance, eternal and unseen things in the heavens. We've got, our have, we've got to have our eyes fixed there. Paul is concerned with their spiritual well-being, the state of their heart, the state of their mind in Christ, the state of their soul. So after all, then, of the instruction in this letter, what does it come down to as Paul draws the letter to a close? Sum it up for us, Paul. What would you say? Well, the net effect of the five commands that Paul now gives us in verse 11, exhort the Corinthian church, to move on to Christian maturity. Taking heed to the instruction instruction that they've been given, Paul now calls those believers in Corinth, and he calls you and I here, to be complete. He calls us to completion. He calls us to Christian maturity. We're to be mature believers in the faith. We're to have a mature faith, right? Right? 
Paul says in verse 11, essentially, rejoice in the Lord, become complete, heed my exhortations, set your mind on the same things, work and labor for peace in the Lord's church. And the net effect of all those commands is that we're to move on to Christian maturity. We're to move on to Christian maturity. Paul's appeal here has a context. His context is the church of Corinth. Okay, And the Corinthians have to mature past the divisions that they have long allowed to plague their church. They have to mature past those divisions. That's a specific problem in the church at Corinth. We know that. Right? They're to work for peace. They're to labor to maintain peace. The Corinthians were factious. There were divisions in their midst. Easily, they were easily led astray by false teachers, false teaching. So they were to heed Paul's exhortations. They needed to think as Paul thought, set their minds on the same things that Paul set his mind on. They had to deal with sin in their midst. Some of the sin that was in their midst wasn't even sin that was normally named among the Gentiles, remember? And Paul is saying, listen, move on to maturity. Pursue holiness. Pursue sanctification. Become complete. Spiritual immaturity was wreaking havoc in the church at Corinth. Well, Paul's appeal there to the church at Corinth in that context also has application in our church today, doesn't it? We're not lost on that, are we? <laughs> we have needs of our own, don't we? We must move on to maturity. Beloved, we must be complete. We must move on to Christian maturity. We have to make progress in the faith. We must move on to maturity. The same behavior that may be cute in a five-year-old would be shameful and repulsive in a 25-year-old. More shameful, more repulsive in a 35-year-old, right? Worse it gets. Well, that same level of understanding, that same degree of maturity and faith that may be understandable in someone who has recently turned to the Lord, recently turned to follow the Lord, would be shameful in someone who has professed to have walked with the Lord for years. You see the connection, the analogy? The Lord commends childlike faith. He does not commend childish faith. We must move on to maturity. We must make progress in our Christian lives. We must be growing in the faith, growing in the Lord. Initially, as we think about that, right, it's understandable if someone who recently turned to the Lord, recently following the Lord, is immature. It's understandable for someone who's recently converted. But at some point, at some point, you run out of excuses for not making progress. You run out of excuses for immaturity. They simply don't exist any longer. There's no excuse for it, right? We must make progress in the Christian faith. We must move on to maturity. When someone is born again of God's Spirit, made a new creation in Christ, they turn from sin, they trust Christ alone for salvation, their sin, that one who turns from sin to trust Christ, their sin was laid upon Christ who suffered the penalty that they deserve. He suffered that on the cross where he died for them. His perfect life, his perfect righteousness, perfection, his perfect righteousness is given to them as a gift of God's grace through faith. They are forgiven of their sin, right? They're washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. They're justified in the sight of God. They're reconciled to God, declared to be righteous in Him themselves, right? Indwelt by the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. And they are saved. They are saved from the penalty of sin, and they are saved from the power of sin. They're saved from the penalty of sin, and they're saved from the power of sin. And from that moment on, by the grace of God, the new Christian then is gradually and progressively being saved from the presence of sin as well, right? That's what the Bible teaches. It's called the doctrine of sanctification. It is a process by which we are made complete. It is a process by which we are brought to maturity. We are to pursue 
the Lord in that process. We are to press on to maturity. Perfection, we're not talking about perfection, right? We're talking about direction. We're talking about a process, a process of sanctification. Perfection cannot and will not be attained on this side of eternity. It will not be attained on this side of eternity. But the Christian, the one indwelt by the Spirit, the one who's been cleansed from their sin, forgiven of their sin, is now called to a life of progress, is now called to a life of increasing holiness. That new believer, that Christian, is called to a life of increasing faithfulness, increasing obedience, increasing knowledge, increasing wisdom, increasing peace, increasing joy, increasing Christ-likeness, increasing Christian maturity. That's the call of every single Christian. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by works. We're saved by the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must be zealous in the work of every true Christian, which is to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. We're to pursue Christian maturity. Peter says it this way. He says, For this very reason, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. We're to be engaged, brothers and sisters, in that pursuit. That's what we're to do. Right? That's what we're to pursue. We're to pursue Christian maturity. And Peter says, if these things are yours, and if they abound. Notice the condition. If they are yours, and if you abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. We are to become complete. <laughs> We're to move on to maturity. And there is a a warning there, isn't there, if we do not. A stagnant or persistent immaturity in your Christian life, a stagnant or persistent immaturity in the Christian church is devastating and destructive. It is devastating. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul, Paul told this church back then, when he was with them the first time, listen, he says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men. I could only speak to you as men of flesh, as to infants, as to babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Not able to receive solid food. Indeed, even now, Paul says, you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since... There is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? And what sin, if we think about our study in 2 Corinthians, what sin was it that Paul was concerned about finding them in when he visits the church the third time in Corinth? In chapter 12, verse 20, look there. Chapter 12, verse 20. Contentions, that's strife from 1 Corinthians 3. Jealousies. Mentioned way back in 1 Corinthians 3. Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, and tumults. In other words, it's apparent, it's apparent at this point that many in the church at Corinth have so far failed to move on in Christian maturity. There is still contentiousness, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, backbitings, whispering, conceits, and tumults. Immaturity will leach into the way that you deal with adversity. You know that to be true if you follow Christ for any length of time. You think, you think that you're doing just fine. You may even think that you're running strong until you're faced with a difficulty, faced with adversity, and you neither have the faith nor the wisdom to deal with that circumstance. You fall on your face and you bloody your nose and you learn the hard way, right? Immaturity will continue to derail 
your efforts to battle sin. Immaturity will undermine your battle against sin. Immaturity will render your fight ineffective, right? You don't grow in grace and spiritual understanding in the faith. You don't grow in wisdom. And so you battle with the very same destructive, besetting, and soul-destroying sins day in and day out, week in and week out, with little progress and little victory. Why? Because you have not progressed. You have not progressed, moved on to maturity in that battle with sin. The Christian's going to battle sin until the cows come home. But the Christian will have increasing victory in that battle, not constant defeat. If they're a brother at all, an immaturity leaves that brother weak and worldly and foolish. Weak, worldly, and foolish. They can't handle solid food. They can't handle solid food, so they don't cultivate, they don't cultivate a love for the doctrine that accords itself with godliness. Right? There's no love for theology. There's no love for the things of God. And so they're left in weakness and worldliness and foolishness. They're not growing in faith. They're not growing in obedience. And so a simple trial, a simple difficulty, can leave them disobedient and faithless. We must move on to maturity. Listen to this from the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs often refers to the spiritually immature as simple. Listen to this from Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. The simple believes every word. Whatever comes along, they take it in, right? The simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. The one who is prudent, the one who is mature, considering well his steps, knows where to walk. Knows where the potholes are, knows where the ditches lie, and he avoids them, right? The simple, following, falling all over himself all the time. Simple believing everything that comes along. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 18. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. See the connection there? But the simple, they pass on and are punished. They pass on by things without heeding them, without noticing, without knowing. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 32. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Immaturity, a failure to make real progress in your Christian life, is available to anyone who won't do anything about it. <laughs> right? Turning of the way of the simple will slay them. The complacency of fools will destroy them. Complacency destroys. Immaturity eventually slays. <laughs> we see it, don't we? This is not mysterious to us. Someone who doesn't make progress in their Christian faith, who doesn't grow in the faith, something comes along and simply sidelines them in their professed Christian life, sometimes knocking them off the rails altogether. We see it happen before our eyes. Move on to maturity. Trust the Lord. Cultivate a healthy, thriving, growing faith. We need that in our Christian lives, right? When they're turned out of the way for lack of faith, they're turning away will slay them. Those who wallow in immaturity, the complacency of those fools will be their destruction. Initially, there may be reasons why someone would be immature. Eventually, there's absolutely no excuse for it. In our text, Paul exhorts the Corinthians with closing remarks and gives us five closing commands to help us, to command us to move on to maturity. Five closing commands. He begins in verse 11, where Paul says, finally, right? we're coming to the end of our letter. Finally, that word ref re refers to what remains, right? The word has the sense of regarding the rest or in summary, right? In summary, finally, brethren, here are five closing commands, five words given in close succession here, with the purpose, filled intent of moving us on to maturity. Five closing commands. First, 
The word translated farewell in verse 11 in the New King James Version, that word often used in a traditional way of saying farewell at the end of a letter or saying hello, greetings, at the beginning of a letter. It's a traditional way of using that word, but the word here is actually in the imperative. It's a command. It's from the verb Cairo for you Greek guys, and it's far better translated here, rejoice. It's a command to, to rejoice. Some of your translations state it that way, okay? Think with me. If we're to move on to maturity, we are commanded by the Lord to rejoice. We're commanded to rejoice. It's our duty to be joyful. It's a moral obligation for Christians to rejoice. It's the very same word that Paul used in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, where com Paul commands us there to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Same verb, same form. Okay? It's a command to rejoice. And we often forget the importance or the necessity of pursuing joy in the Christian life. Sometimes we're, really, we're passive with that. It's a reflexive emotion, right? We're, we're passive in it. But here it is. Paul begins with a command to be joyful. Joy in the Lord. Joy in what the Lord has accomplished for His people. Joy in the blessings of salvation. Joy in the hope of the glory of God. Joy and rejoicing in the truth. Joy in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Joy in your salvation. Joy in your inheritance. That's not, that joy, that informed joy, that fueled joy is not an empty feeling. It's not a shallow emotion. It's not superficial. It's not sentimental. It's not sappy, right? It's not shaken. Because of that, it's not shaken at the first sign of adversity. It's not manipulated and undermined by distress or worry or disappointment. No, this joy, this joy is a resolute, persistent, determined, informed, and fueled joy that should be pursued and cultivated. We need to pursue this joy. This is a disciplined joy. This is a joy that comes from pursuing it and cultivating it and thinking about it. We're used to thinking of joy as something passive, something that we react with in our circumstances. Something happens and I feel joyful. Something happens and I don't feel joyful anymore, right? We're passive. We're used to thinking about it as something passive. Joy is often considered by the world as something that happens to us. And we think about it that way rather than thinking about joy as something done by us. And the Christian, as Paul commands this now in this letter, we need to begin thinking about joy as something done by us. Something cultivated by us. Something that we pursue. That means, that means, doesn't it, that failure to rejoice is a sin. Failure to rejoice in the Lord, when we're commanded by God to rejoice in the Lord, failure to rejoice in the Lord is sin. Failure to rejoice in the Lord is a fruit of our fallen flesh. Now, there are certainly times in the Christian life, aren't there, where we are filled with sorrow. The Lord Himself was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. But James would say, consider it all joy when you fall into those various trials. Consider it all joy when you face that difficulty, that adversity. Why? Because we know what the Lord is accomplishing, what the Lord is doing through that Adversity. So even in the midst of sorrow, even in the midst of difficulty, there is an element of informed joy. It's interesting what James goes on to say there in James chapter 1, verse 2. Listen to James. My brethren, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work so that you may be complete. <laughs> Perfect and complete, mature, lacking nothing, right? So even in that adversity, even in that difficulty, we are to be joyful in the Lord. There's a connection there, isn't it? That persistent joy is the fruit of a maturing faith in the Lord. 
when you are maturing in Him, you are maturing in the faith, maturing in your Christian life, when you're being sanctified, you become more and more increasingly persistent and consistent in your joyfulness in every circumstance that comes across your plate, right? We learn how to deal with those in faith. We learn how to trust the Lord. So then how do we obey a commandment to rejoice? How do we obey that? Remember that this joy, the joy that's being spoken of here, is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So how are we to obey a commandment to rejoice? Well, the Spirit testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we cultivate joy in our Christian life? You must learn about, think on, ponder, meditate on, and think about and learn about and meditate more and then follow and continue to follow, consistently follow the one who is the source and life spring of all true joy, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul gives us the answer, doesn't he? We are to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We hear of Him, learn of Him through God's Word, under the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Ironing, sharpening iron among the saints in our discussion, in our conversation, when we talk about the Lord, when we sing hymns and praises to His name, right? When we worship Him together as a church, when we obey Him, when we go out and preach the gospel, we learn to love the Lord in that way and we cultivate joy. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit does that work in us as we pursue those means to Christian joy. The Spirit does that work. And even in those times when we're unable to rejoice in our circumstances, we can always rejoice in Christ. Even at those times when it's really hard, when it's really difficult, isn't that true? We, we still, like we see the goodness of God in it. We can rejoice in Christ. As we come to know Him and love Him, the Spirit produces joy in us. We must press on in our knowledge of Him. We must press on in our understanding, in our wisdom. We must press on and cultivate faith in Him. That kind of joy is a discipline. That kind of joy is a pursuit. And Paul, it's appropriate that he should command us to apprehend that kind of joy here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. If those means appointed by God for your sanctification, if those means appointed by God that cultivate that kind of joy in the heart of a believer, if those means are a drudgery to you, then I can tell you, without having to ask another question, that you are not joyful as you ought to be. Where are you finding joy? What is it that you think is joy? If that's not it, you're failing in this basic Christian duty. If those means that God has appointed by which He cultivates your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, your growth in faith, if those means are a drudgery to you, your joy is going to be lacking. If you're joyless in your Christian life, what should you do? Pursue joy. Pursue those means and cultivate joy in Him. I um, am reminded... Um, Often, a, a, a long time ago, I started um, trying to be consistent in reading a devotional book at the same time that I'm doing my day, daily Bible reading, my prayer in the morning, you know, first wake up. And so I want to think about the Lord. I want to meditate on the Lord. And it's helpful sometimes for me to uh, read the Psalms. But I started reading a devotional book alongside my morning devotions just to, you know, a, a good, godly Christian man come alongside uh, to point us to those good things in God's Word that kindles affection in our heart for Him, right? It raises our affections, causes our mind to think and to ponder on His goodness, His grace, His mercy. And so I remember reading a book uh, that I can hardly commend to you. It's a book called Rejoicing in Christ by Michael Reeves. I was reading the book as I'm uh, read a little bit, think, read the Psalms, meditate, and then pray. And um, the Lord uses those means, the means of God's Word in particular, but the means of that meditation on God. Even the meditations of other godly men are helpful, right? Other godly ladies are helpful sometimes as we think about the Lord together in community. 
how that raises our affections and causes our heart to be warmed. Um, it's a... Uh, It's necessary that we cultivate that kind of pursuit, that kind of joy. We need to be rejoicing in the Lord. If you rejoice in the Lord, you're going to seek Him in private communion with Him. If your joy is in the Lord, you're going to seek Him in His Word. If your joy is in the Lord, you're going to be seeking obedience to His commands. Right? If your joy is in the Lord, you're going to fervently and faithfully follow Him. This kind of joy is an apathy killer. It is an indifference destroyer, right? This kind of joy. This is the kind of joy that we need. Apathy and indifference will keep you from making progress in your Christian faith, in your Christian walk, in your Christian life. If you are apathetic or indifferent for any length of time, you are wallowing in immaturity. You're making no progress. Move on to maturity. Pursue joy. Pursue love. This kind of joy is an apathy killer. And it is attainable by the Christian in the Christian life through faith. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have commanded it as he does. It's a command for the Christian to pursue this. First is joy. Second, Paul commands the Corinthians in verse 11 to become complete. To become complete. It's the command to press on in Christian growth toward maturity. And that command, it is a command, it is not optional. It's not optional. It is not optional to sit back on your laurels and say, it's enough for me to believe, it's enough that I'm saved, I've got nothing else to do, I'm just going to wait until the Lord takes me home. <laughs> this pursuit to become complete is not optional, it's a command. Being complete is something we are commanded to pursue. We saw a form of this word back in verse 9 where Paul prayed there for them to be complete. He prayed to the Lord for them to be complete. Katartizo is the word. The word suggests that we are to put ourselves in order. We are to take ourselves in hand. We are to put aside that which is disordered. It necessitates that we are consistently and persistently repenting of sin, walking in truth, disobedience replaced by obedience, complacency replaced by commitment, indifference replaced by devotion, right? being not conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Unbiblical thinking must be rejected, put off. Errors must be eradicated. The Word of God is clear. We must follow it. Right? Think as He thinks. Do as He does. Broken relationships must be restored. Priorities must be put in order. Aren't we like a constant walking calamity sometimes with our own priorities. We can't seem to get ourselves put in priority order. Put your priorities in order. What is it that's most important? Most of the time, it's not that dumpster fire that's burning right in front of you. It's God's Word that's most important, prayer that's most important, faith that's most important. Start there, right? Those are the big blocks we need to put in place first. Put priorities in order. We must move on to maturity, become complete. For you language guys, the verb here is either middle or passive. Either middle or passive. Either way, the action or the involvement of the Corinthians is being called for. When Paul commands us to be complete, it's not merely that it's passive on us and we can let go and let God. That's ungodly theology. It's not biblical. It necessitates our involvement. We're to be involved in this pursuit. We're called to become complete. Again, like joy, the Spirit of God is the one who does this work and produces this fruit. The Spirit of God does it. But God uses means to produce that fruit. And we are to pursue those means if we would see that fruit. So let's look at the means. How are we brought to completion by the Spirit of God? Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter Galatians, Ephesians Philippians, go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1. Look at verse 28. How do we pursue completion? How do we obey this command? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Paul says, Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, we preach. 
Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, so that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. That word perfect there is referring to completion, referring to to maturity, right? We're to move on to maturity. Paul says his goal, his aim here is to present every man perfect, complete, mature in Christ Jesus. To this end, verse 29, their perfection, their maturity, their completion, to this end I also labor, striving according to His working which works in me mightily. So how is it then? Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. How is it that we present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus? Well, we preach Him. Who? Jesus Christ. Right? We preach the Lord Jesus Christ and we work diligently. We labor and we strive according to His power that work, works in us. You see? We work diligently. We labor and we strive preaching Christ. It's the preaching of Christ that matures us to perfection in Him. Right? The preaching of Christ. It's not human wisdom. It's not worldly philosophy. Listen, it's not your own reason. I think this is right or I think that is right. It's what the Bible says. It's what God says is right. right? It's God's Word. Rather, not human wisdom, not worldly f- philosophy, rather it's warning every man, Paul says, teaching every man in all wisdom. That wisdom comes from the Word of God. And that's what it takes if we're to present every man perfect, mature, and complete in Christ. All that with diligent labor toil, and striving. It's a word used in athletics. It's laboring to the point of exhaustion, right? Laboring to the point of being weary and tired, working hard. And listen, that's not just your elders laboring in preaching and teaching. That's you. That's us together laboring in preaching and teaching. That's you warning and teaching every man. That's you sitting under the preaching and teaching and being warned and being taught, right? That's you laboring, that's us laboring, that's all of us laboring, striving together. We've been given that role, that means, by which we're to pursue that completion. Uh, that completion. Turn back to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And we see this said clearly here in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. We are means through which that pursuit takes place. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says, And he himself, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not for the so-called saints to sit back in their seats and watch the show. (laughs) We're all in ministry together. The Lord gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, a complete man, a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that, verse 14, we should no longer be children, We should no longer be like infants or toddlers or babies in our faith, in our knowledge, in our understanding, who are, verse 14, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. We've seen it time and time again, haven't we? Someone immature in their faith is not pursuing completion. They're not making progress in the Christian life and they are sucked out of this church by some false teacher, some false teaching that now they've embraced as right and true that's not right and true and they make shipwreck of their faith. Or it's some trial and they can't bear it any longer. I can't bear up under this, under this difficult, any, difficulty any longer and so they make shipwreck of their faith by departing the Lord and disobeying His commandments. Right? We're to be mature. But, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, that's our responsibility, we may grow up, we may move on to maturity in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. 
from whom the whole body, joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every single part does its share, causes growth for the body, growth toward maturity, growth toward completion, for the building up of itself, the edifying of itself in love. In order to come to a unity of the faith, in order to come to a perfect, complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, growing up in all things into him who is the head, you have to be involved in the work of the ministry. You have to be submitted to the work of the ministry. You have to be yielded to the work of the ministry. You have to be a beneficiary of the work of the ministry, laboring, striving according to His working, which works mightily in you. We need to become complete. Third. Third. Paul commands the Corinthians, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, to be exhorted. That's what the word there means. Translated, be of good comfort in the New King James Version. Not a good translation. The word is from parakaleo, to call alongside, to come alongside, to call alongside. And here, this is a command. Not simply to be of good comfort. It's a command to be exhortable. <laughs> the sense here is for the Corinthians to heed Paul's exhortations. To listen. We're to listen. We're to consider what's being said, and we're to consider what it is that we're missing. If I approach the Word of God like I know what it says, and I can't be taught anything, am I going to make progress in my Christian faith? Make progress in knowledge? Make progress in understanding? Make progress in wisdom? No, because I got it all figured out, and nobody's going to get away with teaching me, right? No, no. We're to be exhortable. We're to be teachable. We're to be entreatable. We're to respond to encouragement, respond to, to instruction, respond to correction, respond to reproof. We need to stop being self-willed or stubborn in rebellion. Right? Receive instruction. You have instructors. We all have instructors. Receive instruction. Receive correction. You and I, we together... We have elders placed over us by God. And that is for your good, for my good. That's for our good. Receive their instruction. Receive it. And what does it mean to receive it? They can talk all they want to, but that's not right. And I don't agree with that. And that's not right either. Is that receiving their instruction? No. You've got godly brothers and sisters in this church. Receive instruction. What is it? That I'm missing. If I've got a brother and we're at odds on some doctrinal point, what is it that I'm not seeing? And if I don't know what it is, I need to seek understanding first and then receive what's being taught to me. <laughs> receive instruction. Receive correction. Seek to understand. Be a Berean. Search the, the Scriptures diligently to see if these things are so, but stop being obstinately belligerent. Consider what it is that you may be missing. If you can't be taught anything, you're never going to learn anything. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 31. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. Wise people, wise people receive instruction. They put themselves in a place physically to receive instruction, right? They put themselves in a place mentally, emotionally. They put themselves in a place spiritually to be instructed, to heed instruction. They put themselves in a place mentally, emotionally, spiritually to heed correction. They submit themselves to biblical authority. Proverbs chapter 12, the one who despises rebuke, despises correction or instruction is stupid, they don't move on to maturity. The mature heed counsel. The mature heed instruction. The mature heed correction. Otherwise, you remain in ignorance. And listen, ignorance is a maturity killer. 
Ignorance is a maturity killer. Move on to maturity. Move on to completion. Move on to understanding. Be exhorted. Paul had warned the Corinthians here to reaffirm their love for the one who had sinned against them in chapter 2. Right? He warned them, reaffirm your love for that one. Forgive him and comfort him, Paul said. I'm putting you to the test to see whether you are obedient in all things. Do that, Paul says, lest Satan should take advantage of us. Paul exhorted the Corinthians. Paul exhorted the Corinthians about many things, right? That being one of them. Paul warned the Corinthians not to receive the grace of God in vain. In chapter 6, Paul warned, exhorted the Corinthians to cut off fellowship with the unrighteous. Unrighteous. What communion has light with darkness, Paul asked, right? What accord with Christ does Christ have with Belial? You are the temple of the living God. Cut off unrighteous influences. Paul had exhorted the Corinthians to give. Give to the work of the kingdom. Give sacrificially in grace for the church that is in Jerusalem, for the needs of, the, of God's people. That has application in our church, doesn't it? Paul exhorted the Corinthians we're to be exhorted. We're to heed the Lord's exhortation. We're to heed instruction. We're to receive it. Fourth, Paul commands the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. The word here means to set your mind on the same things. Set your mind on the same things. To think the same things. This is opposite opposite of those sins that Paul was concerned about in chapter 12, verse 20. Do you see? They're to be of one mind. They were anything but. And Paul was concerned about that in chapter 12, verse 20. Beloved, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We are like partakers of the divine nature. And we are being called to like-mindedness in the Lord's church. This is a command. Right? This doesn't mean that we're always going to agree on everything. We're not going to agree on everything, but unity is the, the aim. Not uniformity. That's not the aim, but unity. Unity is the aim. We are all being called to share common convictions. We're all being called to share common aims, common purposes. We are to be of the same mind. Now, this is doctrinal unity, and this is a unity of practice, right? Practical unity. We have a very clear a very specific way in which we as a church have covenanted together to apply the Scriptures to our common practice as a church. We've been very clear about that. Nothing mysterious about it. Very clear. We believe that the life of the church together is critical to our maturity. And yet there are always those who buck against that commitment almost as soon as it's made. Are you one of those? We've not changed. The commitment is the same. That commitment that you were called to when you become a member of this church is the commitment that exists now. Why, over time, have you begun to kick against the goads? <laughs> we began with like-mindedness concerning those things, and then your mind began to change. Our mind has not changed. You absent yourself from the teaching, you absent yourself from the preaching. You absent yourself from small group, from the life of this church. You find yourself all of a sudden running against the current. We're called, we're commanded to be of the same mind. That's why we have a confession of faith. That's why we have a constitution. That's why we have a covenant. We're called to be of the same mind. Not to uniformity, but to, to be unified. In our common goals, in our common aims, our common purposes, our common intents. Paul doesn't merely call us to some sappy, sentimental harmony. This is not Disney. <laughs> right? Let's just get along. Can't we just get along? Agree to disagree. No. <laughs> Paul calls us to be of one mind in Christ. Work it out. Work through issues. Keep your commitments. Resolve conflicts. That's what we're to do. If you have a conflict, if something's wrong, you have an issue, don't keep it inside where it brews and broils until at one point it explodes and you wreck your ship. Resolve that. Work to set 
your mind on the same things. Result, resolve to be like-minded. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. Paul prays this. He says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our unity in Christ. That we may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't merely apply to practice, but there is to be doctrinal unity as well. We have a confession of faith. A confession of faith that is clear. A confession of faith that we wholeheartedly agree with and believe best represents the teaching of the Bible. And that's what we're preaching and teaching in this church. We preach and teach in agreement with our confession. We are like-minded with those brothers. And we call all of you, us together, to be like-minded with one another in following that good doctrine. Paul told this very church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, <laughs> and there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete. Do you see the, the connection between moving on to maturity, moving on to completion, and that like-mindedness, right? He calls them, and he calls us, to all agree so that there be no divisions among you, but rather that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. We're called to maturity, and Paul does that by calling us to set our mind on the same things. Fifth, the fifth command is in direct connection to the fourth command in chapter 13, verse 11. Paul commands the Corinthians to keep the peace. That's what it means there. To keep the peace. It's an imperative. It's active. To live at peace with one another. We are to be of the same mind. That's its connection to number four. We're to be of the same mind. And if we're of the same mind, we're, there will be peace. And we're to strive to maintain that peace. That means... Contra what Paul expected to see in them or was concerned he might find in them. In chapter 12, verse 20, there are to be no contentions, no jealousies, no strife, no bickering, no backbiting. We are called to keep the peace. We think about the net effect of all five of these commands together. Think with me, right? All imperatives, they're all commands. All of these imperative verbs are in the present tense which reminds us that these pursuits are to be a continuous, ongoing, present effort of the people in this church. You and I are commanded to a continuous, ongoing, present labor and effort striving to pursue these five commands. And notice with me, in verse 11, the promise that is attached to those commands. Look at it with me. Finally, brethren, rejoice. Become complete. Be exhorted. Set your mind on the same things. Keep the peace. And, here's the promise, the God of love and peace will be with you. Notice that that promise is conditional. It's conditional in the context. The blessing of peace is available for those who are pursuing completion, pursuing maturity. If we pursue these things, if we obey these com commands, the God of love and peace will be with us. God Himself is the source of all love and peace, and so Himself is the God of love and peace, right? Love and peace are given to those whose spirit-produced character are not at odds with it, not at odds with these pursuits, not at odds with this practice and this doctrine. And the Lord, if we think about that in verse 11, the Lord's always with the Christian, right? We're indwelt by the Spirit. The presence of God always with us. Lo, Jesus Christ says, and I am with you even to the end of the age. But here, what Paul intends to communicate in verse 11 is that the more faithful we are in our pursuit of these commands, our pursuit of these realities, these graces, the more fully and the more richly we enjoy that blessing of His presence. The more faithfully, the more 
vigorously, fervently, devotedly we pursue these commands, the more we'll experience a blessing of that gracious presence. But what keeps you from pursuing these to maturity? What keeps you from maturity? Apathy? Apathy keeps you from maturity. Apathy is essentially saying, I don't care. I don't care. You struggle with apathy. You know what I'm talking about. Indifference will keep you from pursuing these commands to maturity. Indifference will keep you from making progress in your Christian life. Laziness. These are pursuits. They're efforts. We're commanded in Scripture to give all diligence to them. We're to give all diligence to them. Laziness will keep you from that. Apathy says, I don't care. Laziness may or may not care, but not willing to lift a finger to do anything about it. Right? Laziness. Ignorance. Ignorance will keep you from pursuing these graces. Apathy, indifference, laziness, ignorance are maturity killers. You will wallow in immaturity. You will remain simple. You will make no progress. We must move on to maturity, brothers and sisters. We must become complete. Set aside complacency. Set aside worldliness. Set aside apathy. Set aside indifference. Set aside laziness. Set aside ignorance. Pursue the Lord. Pursue these commands and be complete. It's upon these closing exhortations. Powerful and loaded, right? Simple words, simple commands with so much weight. And upon that, Paul brings this wonderful letter to a close. He says in verse 12, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, I'm going to advise that that is descriptive, not prescriptive. <laughs> a holy kiss was familial. It was an expression of love, not in any way sensual, not on the mouth. <laughs> it was loving. It was familial. It was um, a family Kiss. It was an expression of family love. We might equate this today with a holy hug <laughs> or a holy handshake, right? Uh, but this is the way that you would greet a beloved brother or sister. That one who is beloved to you, uh, they are to greet with a holy kiss. This, this um, sign of affection in the Lord's church at the center of their greeting to one another, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, we're to be affectionate toward one another that way, uh, as a brother would be to a beloved sister, or as a sister would be to a beloved brother. This is familial. It's an expression of Christ-like love, an expression of Christ-like affection. Remember when the Lord was raised from the dead, and the ladies saw him on the road, what did they do? They fell at his feet, they gripped him, they hugged, held him, hugged him, right? Um, love the Lord. We're to show that kind of Christ-like love and affection toward one another, our brothers and sisters in the church. So greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. We have extended family also. <laughs> we have extended family also. One day we'll all be together, uh, the bride, together, worshiping Him in heaven forever, uh, worshiping Him in the new heavens and the new earth. All the saints greet you. And verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The grace there in verse 14 is the grace of Christ. Interesting, isn't it? He said in chapter 8, verse 9, you know, Paul reminds us, right? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. It is appropriately the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ reveals to us, or communicates to us, the love that is of God. The love that is of God who is Himself love. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to know deeply, don't we, the love of God toward us in Him. And the communion that we have is through the Holy Spirit. That fellowship that we have is fellowship in the Spirit. All a work of the triune God. 
how anyone can deny the Trinity is self-willed ignorance. This is all a work, a perfect economy of labor, all a work of the triune God. 